bless this message today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Once again, uh, God bless each and every single one of you uh, this morning. <clears throat> Our text is found in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. And uh, I, I would like you to please open your Bibles and keep it open in those chapters, um, chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. And we also have as a background study Psalms 119, verses 11, and Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. And uh, the main idea here is that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is revealing four attitudes that Christian can display at any time. At any point in your work with God, uh, these are four things that you will not escape. These are four things that are inevitable. These are not. These are four things that are not by choice. Uh, but a lot of times, uh, it it is uh, revealed or is mainstream through our attitudes, through our um, through our work, and uh, most definitely through our thoughts. So uh, the question here is. Uh, what is the current attitude in the Christian world towards the word of God? Uh, you will not, you'll be surprised how many times as a pastor, I hear people telling me that they're struggling through issues in life. And my first question is to them is how is your study time? How is your prayer life? Well, uh, yeah, we, we read, uh, when we come to church, what about your personal time? You know, um, Brett Ponce and, and I here, we're talking about, um, uh, I'm going to Eric brother uh, Daryl, but we we're talking about the game, you know, <laughs> and how they play at 115 and how I wanted to watch the game. But, you know, it's church time. How many people will will skip church just to uh, watch a game, you know, and uh, how many people will find time to do other things, but read in the word of God. So a key. So the aim here is to make a, a new commitment to be able to be teachable, uh, to be rooted and deeply in faith, uh, to weed out those little strangles to, to that hold us down uh, from learning and from hearing the word of God. So uh, a teachable heart will receive the word of God. That's just it. You know, many, many came to hear the Lord Jesus Christ. Many, many came to hear. Uh, but the, the parables are filled with that. They can, they can listen, but they don't hear. And uh, just like, just like the kid, you know, uh, your teenager, you know, lay, laying, laying in bed and you tell him, uh, fix your room. And he will just say, mm -hmm, uh-huh. And he heard you. He heard you right. He, he even answered, uh-huh, but he didn't listen to you. You know, but if, if you say, hey, you know, the new PS4 or the new, uh, the latest Xbox came out, he, you know, he'd be all ears, you know, like, what's going on? I, I want to tune into that. So hearing doesn't necessarily always mean to be tuning into. And Jesus Christ employed many agricultural uh, metaphors because he knew that that was something that they were familiar with. It's not by, by accident that he uses uh, these techniques uh, to talk to his people. Everybody in Galilee knew about farming. Just like today here in Modesto, you know, you it, we, we're surrounded by agriculture. Everybody knows about not necessarily the, the techniques of farming, but they know about farming. And, and we know from Jesus' explanations about the parable, uh, it's not seeds and it's not just sees the dirt, but it, it talks about how the truth uh, reveals about the word of God and how it is planted in our hearts, the attitudes of the people when they hear the word. Yes, you can hear the word. Yes, you can read the Bible. Yes, you, yes, you can you can go to church and, and sleep through the entire sermon, you know. I mean, you know, but would you go out and apply it? Would you go and, and let it let it grow? That's the, that's the reason why we used to work cultivate, you know, because the seed can fall, but it doesn't germinate. It doesn't do you any good. You can open the Bible uh, and read, read, it, read a chapter, but if you're thinking 
about the football game or if you're thinking about the baseball game or you're thinking about the, the newest uh, trend in Netflix and and you know, it's not gonna it's not gonna sit it's not gonna sit in your heart it's not gonna grow roots uh it's funny this lady was telling me that um, that she read the entire book of mark while she was watching uh squid games on Netflix like wait a minute uh that was very deep because you know i'm a one-track person i'm the kind of person that i cannot chew gum and and watch tv at the same time you know <laughs> i gotta do one one at a time like if i'm typing something you know uh somebody come and interrupts me i have to stop typing because i have to put my full attention yes uh my life my, my mind works as a monochrome mind monochrome one track one way it's not polychrome or multi i cannot multitask you know ladies can watch tv watch watch the beans on the stove watch the kids playing you know steer the spaghetti and uh, talk to their comadres on the telephone and it multitask me i have to do one thing so explain to me how can you read the word of god and watch a series on netflix at the same time I find it truly difficult. So the, the other day, you know, uh, this other friend was complaining about uh, about about the uh, my neighbor about his gardener, you know, leaving weeds in, in in some of the areas. Like, you know, hey, my gardener came. You know, he he left his weeds over here, and and so what does that have to do with the study? Is that a lot of times we let weeds grow in our hearts. We we, lo- we we allow all these other exterior things to entangle our Christian walk, and they come as a form of temptation. They form of temptation. Uh, they come they come as a form of idolatry. So idolatry that means that I'm praying to a saint. No, idolatry is anything that takes you away from the word of God. And unless we are there to to carefully watch what we're growing in our hearts. It could be very well that we're allowing uh, uh, the seed to be work growing in our heart. So the word cultivate, um, unless you grew up in a farm or close to a farm, you may not know what the word cultivate means. And I'm sure all of us here present uh, know what the word cultivate. But for the sake of somebody might be listening, uh, it doesn't mean that you're just going to uh, plow and it's just gonna plant and everything that you plant will grow. Cultivate means to first of all you have to break the surface. You know, uh, you ever seen those big huge tractors? You know, you're driving, you're driving on 132 here in the freeway and you see these huge, huge, huge tractors that doesn't with the little lights and you're waiting. You see the whole well, those tractors they use them in these lands to break the ground. So they have to break the ground. Do you think the farmer wants to invest one hundred thousand dollars in one of those piece of equipment or rent it for fifty dollars an hour? No, they have to. Why do they have to? Because they know that they have to break the ground in order for the seed to germinate. So, do we really, really want to read the word of God and allow God to break us? Absolutely, yes. That's the whole idea. We have to come uh, to the gospel with the idea that. Wait a minute. We're gonna be broken. We're gonna. We have to create in me a new heart, O oh Lord. We have to come with the idea that you know that our heart is gonna be shattered into pieces and put back together by God. So why? Because if we have this hard uh, heart, the word of God is not gonna penetrate. You know. So what? What are some of the things that can harden your heart? you think about it, your daily life you know each each and every single individual have their own thing uh you know you say uh well you know netflix you may you may tell me brother i don't even have tv what what, what about that that motorcycle you're working on uh what about that car that's taking all your time that you you polishing what, what about there are so many things around our daily walk uh, that can hinder uh, the growth, the cultivation of the word of God in our hearts. You know, uh, to have a cultivated taste 
for classical music, to have a cultivated taste for uh, for fine arts. I don't want to say wine because hopefully you're not sipping saints, but you know, there's a lot of sipping saints out there like, oh, wine, you know, Jesus Christ created wine. So that's the excuse to have a little cellar in there hidden in the background. You know? <laughs> so I'm plow ground uh, for the time to seek the Lord until he comes and shower his righteousness on you. If you love the word of God and God and, 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 the, and, the, word of, and the word of God and the God of the word of God, notice I'm, I'm making that very, very uh, simple statement. It sounds like an oxymoron or it sounds like if I'm redundantly saying, if you love the God of the word of God, because you can create yourself uh, another God, the God of, uh, you know, nowadays is, is very easily to, to tune into these preachers on TV and, and they'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, claiming and, and, and all these other preachers that will be telling you that, that that's a different God. That's not the word of the Bible. That's not the God of the Bible. That's not the God of the word of God. So the four different attitudes that describe a Christian in any part of their spiritual journey see that's the beauty of it this lesson applies whether of you got born born again yesterday if you're a teacher if you're a student of the bible you can have been perfectly well 10 years in the ministry if you're a deacon if you're a pastor or or if you're a theologian why because everyone each and every single one of us have a heart there's one thing, uh, you know, that you can ask in church, you know, raise your hand if somebody here doesn't have a heart. Everybody has a heart. So uh, the, regardless of where you, you're, where I'm going to include myself, where, we, where we're at in, in our Christian spiritual walk, we have to have these things in mind. And Luke 8 verses 1 through 15 describe exactly uh, what from directly from, from the prince. People say Spurgeon is a prince of preachers. No. Jesus Christ is the prince of preachers. He's the preacher by excellence. He's the best preacher that ever walked. He's the best teacher that ever walked and will ever walk the planet Earth. So, you know, let's hear from Jesus Christ on as to what he has to say in regards to this issue. Uh, brother, would you mind reading Luke 8? I think you had a reader, Brother Ponzi. And if he's not here, Luke 8, verses 1 through 15. Absolutely. Luke 8, verses 1 through 15. Yes, Just brother. all the way through, right, brother? Yes, brother. Please. Okay. Soon afterwards, he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been headed, healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod Steward, and Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. <clears throat> verse 4 when a large crowd was coming together and those from various cities were journeying with him he spoke by way of a parable the sower went out to sow his seed and as he sowed some fell beside the road and it was trampled underfoot and the birds of the air ate it up other seed fell on rocky soil and as soon as it grew up it withered away because it had no moisture other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop of a hundred times as great. As he said these things, he would call out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 9, his disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And he said, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest... It is in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart, so that they will not believe 
and not be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in a time of temptation fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard. And as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. And then verse 15, but the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Uh, that's uh, been very fulfilling to hear you reading the word of God because I wouldn't speak it so eloquently as you have and so understandably as you have. So uh, thank you for doing that. And uh, according to this parable, so let's look into the heart that is hardened. Well, it's really easy. Well, a hard heart was a stubborn heart, and you can configure it, all this, all these elements. But, but if we look from the from a spiritual point, the way Jesus meant for us to understand it, uh, which is according to verse uh, four and five, uh, represents a person that is hearing the word of God, whether it's in person, whether it's in the radio or television, but. Um, Perhaps today you may not consider yourself a, a hardened heart. And uh, evidently you're not because you're here. But uh, if anyone out there listening uh, for the first time, that you don't think that, uh, well, I'm not that person. You know, you know, we get defensive, you know, like, well, how, how dare you preach? You will ever, ever preach this sermon. Everybody here is, is brother. we're here, aren't we? We're all receptive. So, uh how dare you preach on a hardened heart? So all of us, all of us, my brothers here, we're all saved and we all come to church and play hymns and we're joyful. And so, uh, but what about uh, people who have been hardened by despair? Think about if you've been hit with despair, you lost your job, you lost a loved one, uh, you simply uh, have the tendency to give up why, why, why does Satan come and try to steal our joy? Precisely so that we get hardened. See, that's, that's the strategy of the devil. The devil is not the devil just because, you know, it is a good advertising technique for the Bible. No, the devil is because he's real and he will come and steal your joy. Steal the word from you. And that's what the Bible said. And he was coming in Jesus' day uh, for, a block, for a flock of birds swarming around a farmer and eat the seed that it was just tossed. So imagine you would imagine if you one of you went went out and bought a um, hundred pounds of corn and to cultivate in a small land that you have. So a hundred pounds of corn that you're spreading and as you're spreading there's a flock of crow, crows following you eating the seed. Now will that seed grow? Absolutely not. Why? Because the birds are still in it. And, and, and the Lord here employs that metaphor to let us know that there are things that, first of all, uh, the, it, the seed will never grow because the seed is either gone or because our hearts have been trampled on by other people. Uh, we, we, we're growing in, in a society where nobody trusts anybody. Everybody has security alarms in your cars, in your homes, can't, you know, you, you lock, triple lock your door, make sure that, you know, I'm sure Brother Ponzi, he has to go through all these locks when he goes show houses, you know, like, huh? how many, geez, how many locks do you need to close the door, man? You know, like, you know, and then you have all these locks everywhere, alarms and sensors. Why? Because perhaps somewhere along the line, somebody broke into your house. Uh, uh, and uh, you'd be surprised having trouble concentrating the book the good book reading the bible when you're when your heart has been hard in it like wait a minute how, how can you post how can you how, how can you put the other cheek man you know the first blow hurts me 
I, 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 I seriously doubt it that I'm gonna uh, put on my other cheek, you know. Do, do you hear an echo by any chance? No, you're actually good. Okay, give me no. one microsecond, please. I have to. Sound really good. Thank you very much, brother. Uh, as we're going through, uh, my sec my second heart is a shallow heart. Shallow. A shallow heart has no roots. Shallow has no roots. So the word of God is a start. And uh, it's very easy to get uh, slip into the category of the shallow heart. Notice the first one is a hard one. It's a little bit harsh. And I'm sure most people will now wouldn't want to identify because we're in denial. Uh, for the most part, we're in denial. We don't, we don't think. We think we're doing good. So for us to be confronted with uh, this truth, a lot of times, if Jesus had difficulties confronting this truth, imagine you and I. Uh, in our daily walk with 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 our spouses, with our children, and people around us, and in most definitely in our congregation. So a shallow heart is very easy to slip into the category of the shallow heart, because notice Jesus said, uh, "These people will receive the word with joy, and they react with an emotional acceptance." Mm -hmm. You know, yes, they 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 follow. You know, somebody does a, an altar call, they go, they listen, and they're happy. And God bless you, sister. God bless you. They hug, they smile, they 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 share cookies, they you know, they they come to the to the festival and, and everything is amen and amen. So apparently uh there's tears of joy on Sunday. Oh pastor, you preach a good sermon, and the emotion is gone, the commitment is gone. The moment the emotion is gone, the commitment is gone. So so this heart is just based on an emotion. You know, this heart is truly just based on the moment. Uh, when you're faced with reality, when you go back to work on Monday, do you, do you remember what the pastor was talking about? So they hope they can get enough joy to last them through the next week. Uh, pastor, your sermon was great. Uh, what about um, that joy? Will it stay until Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? And, and so notice I say Thursday. That's a new week, day of the week. You may be wondering what's wrong with an emotional faith. What's wrong with it? What's wrong if Joel Olsen tell me, you know, declare and be happy? What's wrong with these motivational speakers? What's wrong with all this gospel that uh, that is 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 just uh, telling you to be positive and 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 to have that good attitude and be joyful, brother? Are you against that kind of gospel? Well, according to the word, if if that's all you're getting. An emotional jolt. I can go to Starbucks and buy myself a cup of coffee, and that's gonna give me the same emotion. I'll be joyful for the rest of the morning, and I'll be listening to the radio, and I'll be all happy. So, question here: Are we rooted and grounded in the Word of God? That's the real question. The massive redwood trees in the west here in in the in the West Coast. Imagine how amazing the amazing heights, you know. But surprisingly. Uh, they have very short, weak roots. They're they're huge. They're huge. But if once you see these fallen trees, you see that the roots it didn't compensate to the size of the tree. So, are you displaying a very wonderful uh, Christian walk? But perhaps you're not as rooted. So when the storm comes, you just fall down like a like a palm tree with very shallow roots. So. We need to evaluate how much of a Christian walk are we displaying and how much of a Christian walk are we really holding inside. So uh, moving forward, a crowded heart that has no room. So the word is strangled. When we are, once again, I was saying earlier about multitasking, we're too busy. I mean, we're too busy. Brother, you want to come to Bible study? No, man, I'm really sorry. I'm working overtime. Brother, do you do you want to uh, uh, go to this retreat? Uh, no, I'm sorry, man. I, I I gotta go. I told the the buddies at work that I was gonna go bowling. Uh, so there's always there's always something else that takes priority in our lives, and this this is, in my opinion, the third category that most people uh, will not really recognize. You know, uh, 
it, you'll be amazed. Uh, I, I'm truly amazed. And forgive me if I share my experience with Pastor, but it, I'll be amazed how on Sunday you ask, brother, uh, what happened to your wife? Oh, no, she was baking. And she, come on. Out of all the hours that you have in a week, you pick that little slot that the church is going on to bake a cake. Out of all this other time that you have, because you have so much going on. So why? So what does that mean? That there's no roots. You're a Christian because somebody told you that, hey, you're a Christian now, believe a happy life. But in reality, somewhere along the way, the growth stopped the process. It was interrupted. The, 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 the roots didn't grow enough so that you can be uh, there when the, so when the storm comes, you get you easily fall out or you easily is I would say you easily choke uh, according to the word. There is a limited amount of moisture in the nutrients in your heart. So the weeds and the thorns compete with the good plants. So how is my Christian attitude? Is supposed to show when I have all these other negative elements, you know, I work, you know, all these people cussing around us, all these people saying dirty jokes, all these people uh, trying to plot against you uh, and, and, and the competition in, in today's daily life gets so hard that, wait a minute, now, is my Christian walk is also in competition with all these other things? So the word of God, if we are not careful, they will just be choked out. So the effectiveness of the word of God will lose because we're allowing all these other things. We, notice I used the, the word, we are allowing, because we, we're very quick to, to blame Satan. Right? Oh, the devil made me do it. Mm -hmm. No, we, we're allowing it. I mean, let's face it. Let's be responsible for once in our lives and say, you know what? Yeah, I, I allow to sin and to into my heart i allow for envy i allow for my egotistical attitude to take control that's the way i am that's the way god made me so be it we're very quick to say wait a minute you know they had to face it take it or leave it uh you know whether you like me or not you know that's your problem because that's the way i am that's the way god made me and wait a minute that's that's not the way god made you <clears throat> That's the, world, that's, that's the way the world made you. That's the way that you allow yourself to grow. So we cannot be strangled by worry, by wealth, by pleasures, and all these other elements that are around us and that you know, will hinder our walk with God. So a teachable heart, which is hopefully the, the pinpoint of, of this of this. Uh, teaching this morning is that the, that's the fourth attitude that that Jesus Christ mentioned and hopefully that's the ideal that's the goal that's our that should be our supreme goal that should be our supreme ending in, in our Christian life is when every Christian should strive that Jesus wants us to have that teachable heart and receive the word of God like a soft fertile soil and produce an abundance of crop. Uh, and what's, what's, what's the crop here? Love is one of them. Uh, do you love your neighbor? Do you love your, your redundantly, do you love your loved ones? Uh, yeah, I love my loved ones. Of course I love them. What kind of question is that? That's, that's an oxymoron. That, you, you know your language. Learn your language. Of course, if you're saying the, you love your loved ones, that's redundant, isn't it? No, a lot of times with people that we that we claim that we love, isn't it true that sometimes it's the people that we hurt the most? Mm -hmm. Because we're too we're too engulfing ourselves. We're egotistical. It's me, myself, and I. It's you know if if, if I don't get it, I, I will get it at all costs. That includes stealing from my from my little brother's uh, inheritance. That that includes you know uh, you know insulting my my brethren. So the seed of the word of God is so powerful that all we have to do is plant it. That's all we have to do. Jesus Christ is not saying, uh, well, you're going to have to go out, buy a bigger field or, you know, or just go borrow from the name. No, all we have to do is plant and let it grow. 
and he will do the rest. You know, we're, we're too busy trying to change other people, but we're not busy changing ourselves. Remember, we cannot change anybody. The only people or the only person that we can change is ourselves. So why not let the word of God grow in our hearts? And why don't we allow God to change us? And why not allowing him to be the New Testament in our hearts? You know, uh, we're very skeptical when people tell us about the Bible and we want to, uh, you know, dissect every single word and we're, we're really, we become, uh, we become instant theologians when we hear a simple statement like uh, Proverbs, love you, love you, God, love you, love the Lord with all your heart. And, uh, you know, we automatically we lose our joy because, you know what, automatically we know that we have to compromise with the Lord, automatically we had to make a commitment with, with our church, and automatically we had to give up with all these other things that, that, that we have to give up. Uh, our wine tasting festivals, our music uh, festivals, we had to give up so many things that we think that we had to give up uh, because in reality, uh, they're not doing anything for our hearts. So what kind of heart do we have today? Is it hardened? Is it shallow? Is it overcrowded? Are we able to make that commitment to a daily basis to cultivate our hearts and to become more teachable? Wait a minute. You mean to tell me how long, brother, brother, brother Haney, how many years have you been a pastor? Uh, well, uh, well, uh, uh, two years. Oh, well, I've been in ministry for 25 years and I'm not going to allow a two year pastor to teach me. And we get this attitude, you know, but Ponzi, what are you doing in church? Well, I'm a deacon. Well, you know, I used to be a pastor, so I'm not going to let a deacon to teach me. And we go around finding people that we feel or we think that will teach us. Somebody that know more than we think we do. So in reality, uh, a teaching can become in a, in a smile, in a hug. In a hunch, in a handshake, in a good morning, brother. You know, God bless you. Uh, you know, I was praying about you, and brother, I'm praying about your situation, and and that's where the love of God is really, really making an effect, uh, making an effect in your life. And, and when you hear words that are kind and and that reflect the Christian attitude, that's what we need to multiply multiply and the psalm the psalmist here in psalm 119 verses 105 shows you know the be the light of my path your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path let the word of god shine our walk we have a voracious appetite and the desire to read and hear the, the word of god sadly Many are really uh, more interested in their next uh, meal or in the next uh, uh, Instagram. But nowadays, even old people are looking, doing TikToks and, and <laughs> Snapchats and social media. And, and the word of God, what happened to it? Do we, do we have uh, hobbies that are on other activities that are really? Uh, our source of joy uh, and enjoyment more than hearing the word of God. So here we have uh, an interesting uh, we, we, we have an interesting culture that people are more eagerly to say bon appetit. Uh, bon appetit is your appetite for the word of God. Is my appetite for the word of God. Is my source of enjoyment is listening to the word of God. I, I'm, am I pleased with reading in 8 Mark chapter? What am I going to get out of Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 15? Is, is it a boring teaching? Is, is, it a, is it something that just I've read so many times that I became uh, immune to it? So do, do I still want to listen to the word, word of God with the same eagerness when it was brand new? Uh, my desire to help others 
hearing the word of God. So uh, the application of this parable uh, on a scale of one to five, how would you describe yourself from, on a scale from one to five about being hungry for the word of God? On a scale of one to five, how aggressively do you pursue opportunities to learn, to listen, to study uh, of the word of God? These this teachings on this Saturday morning, they're a great blessing. And, and it's free. It's there. And, uh, you know, if I bet you, if I was to tell you that I'm going to give you uh, the, the chronicles from, from last week's uh, game on the NFL, I, I, will have, I will have a full house, man. I'll have people commenting. I'll have people like cheering. Oh yeah, you know we'll, 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 you know we'll be we'll be pulling statistics back to 1980 uh, when the Niners play. You know the Tigers, and uh, we'll have a full, full, complete conversation. But I hey, mean, who's teaching today, brother Rigo? Oh man, you know okay. Uh, what is he going to be teaching on the parable? Oh, I already know that. I don't know that parable. I heard it so many times. Jesus said, "A teachable heart has a fertile soil." Do I want to have that fertile soil? God, teach me, O oh Lord. Mold me, O oh Lord. Give me a new heart. That should be our prayer. Good soil not only produces crop, but it also produces more seed. Imagine how many people know how many seeds are in an apple. Now, how many people know how many apples are in a seed? So think about all the people that you're impacting around you on a daily basis, when they say, oh, yeah, bro, you know, Brother Daryl, such a kind person. You know, Brother brother Thang, Brother Lauren, Brother Andy, Brother Rudy, Brother Ponzi, Pastor Haney, Brother Richard. And we start thinking about all these people that, that we know and think about how much they affect the communities. It's very sad when you talk to somebody, hey, you know, Brother so-and-so. Yeah, you know, he's a Christian. Oh, is he? Really? I've been working with him 20 years. I didn't even know. You know, so how much are we impacting our world around us? And I get off from the horse right now because I'm going to keep rambling. So, brothers, please go ahead and, and uh, give us your reflections, your commentaries, and, and your questions, anything that you'd like to add. God bless you, brothers. Thank you, Pastor Rigo. Good message, Pastor Rigo. <clears throat> I like the way you referenced Rudy. Um he doesn't have time for the gospel because he's bowling. But anyway, um, yeah, you know, we're actually, we're, uh, my Bible study fellowship group is it's studying Matthew we're right in the parable, right in the parable of the sower. We're studying right now this whole week. And so that was very timely. Uh, I'm going to just ch read a, an excerpt from our lesson. And it says the, uh, it says the farmer represents Christ and his representatives, those who distribute the seed, the message of salvation. And it says the only variable is the condition of the soil, which is what you were talking about. The heart of the person who hears the gospel. The fruitfulness of the seed is determined by the condition of the soil. And it says people who reject the gospel, gospel because of the condition of their hearts. The problem is not with the sow or the seed, but the soil. So um, as you mentioned, you know, it's, it's, it's our hearts, whether we receive the word or not uh, and, and jesus spoke in parables because the non-believers wouldn't understand them. and so the parable should cause us to seek the word of god further uh to get the true meaning but people that don't have time for it or hearts are hardened they just reject the the gospel but um great that was a great um compliment to my our study already thank you amen Thank you so much. <clears throat> a great Bible study of the especially I learned from the way how you explanation about the sower. And especially how much important our heart to prepare to receive God's word. As we see in the Hebrew chapter four, verse twelve, the word God is shepherd to a Joshua. It God word can penetrate our heart. Yes, so how much important to receive our heart to have to prepare our heart. Thank you so much. A great blessing to prepare our heart. Good. Thanks, Pastor Regal. Yeah, very good. Um, 
I was looking at the got questions and, and the way they explained it, which is just almost identical the way you explained it, is that the seed is the word of the kingdom, and the the hard ground represents someone who's hardened by sin and does not understand the word. Um, the stony ground is a man who professes to delight in the word, however, his heart is not changed. And then the thorny ground, um, they receive the word, but their heart is full of riches, pleasures, and lust of the world. The good ground portrays someone who hears, understands, and receives the word, and then allows the word to accomplish its what its results in its life. The man represents the good ground, <clears throat> the one who of the poor is truly saved because salvation's proof of is fruit. And we always talk about that in our Bible study, Al, about the fruit in our lives, and it represents, you know, our salvation. <clears throat> and uh <clears throat> the good word is determined by the condition of our heart, and that's what uh, Pastor Regal was talking about, which is very good, and I like that. So wow. someone who is truly saved will go on to prove it by his displaying of the good soil. So yeah, so I really appreciate that, uh, this teaching today. So uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Regal. Amen, brother, thank you. Yes, thank you, Pastor Regal, for a very good uh, passage of scripture that you brought there to my mind. It takes me back many years ago as to when uh, I was a child and I heard the word and I heard the various songs that were sung, but my heart wasn't ready to receive it yet. As you grow older, your heart is still not with it yet. You might be going to church as a teenager and doing all the things as a teenager does and you hear the word and you listen to your parents and then you grow up and you start going your own way and you get distracted. But then there does come a day in your life, and that day came in my life, when your heart is broken. I mean, you have a broken heart. And when I reached that point in my life, that's when I came to the Lord, because I was broken, and my heart was broken. And I laid my heart right before him, and, and he took that heart, and he changed my desires. My desires were to get into the Word, to study the Word, and to know about just who this Jesus was. Who was this person that was willing to die for my sins and take the punishment for my sins? So my desires were completely changed because I had a very hard heart. And God had tried to get through to it many years before, but I wouldn't let him get into it. And he wouldn't break it. He let me break my own heart. And that's what many of us have to come to. We have to come to that point when we're broken. And if we reach that point, we can go two different ways. We could hear the calling of God and go towards him. Or we could hear the calling of the world and go towards it even further and get further down in the depths. And so we do still have a choice. But God is the one who changes the heart. And once that heart is changed, your desires change. And I look at the Apostle Paul's life and I'm reading in the book of Romans, chapter one or chapter 10, what Paul said about his own heart. Chapter 10 in verse one, this is what Paul said, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So as we look at our hearts today, as we men go through whatever we're going, whether we're at a baseball game, football game, sports, whatever we're doing, are we looking at the people who need to hear the gospel? Are we willing to do like the Apostle Paul did, to reach out to those people? His heart desire and Lately here, with about the last year and a half, my heart's desire has really been poured out to Israel. 
and I've been following what's going on over there in the nation of Israel through some of the teaching that is available. And it's, it's pathetic as to what our world is. Our world has a bunch of people in it that are very, very hard hearted. And it's going to take it's going to take God to really stir a lot of these people up. A lot of the preaching that was being preached now in the different churches have been watered down. Sometimes you don't hear too much about sin anymore and whatever, but sin has got to be dealt with. And Jesus dealt with our sins. And for that, we should all be very, very grateful. Thank you, Pastor, for... Uh, a very good uh, illustration. Jesus is a very good uh, illustrator and his teachings apply just as much as they did then as they do today. God bless you all. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Brother Doyle, uh, brother Doyle when you said that, you know, our, if our hearts are breaking, it reminds me of... Um, being yoked up with Jesus, with Jesus, you know, he says yoke up with me, you know. Uh, if we're yoked up with Him, <clears throat> you know, th then our, heart, our hearts will be broken because we're one with Him. So, it's so true what you're saying there. You know, if we're looking at the world and, and going with with the ideas of the world is and following that, then yeah, that's where our heart will be. But our hearts in the word of God, then we should be broken. Yeah. Thank you, Brother Doyle. Yeah, this is a great reminder to uh, examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith, just as the Apostle Paul reminded the Corinthians. And so that's what I see here. It's an examination, self-examination for us. You know, Pastor Rigo talked about, you know, do we love the word of God or do we love something else more than the word of God? He mentioned about people, you know, choosing other things and getting together at church or they choose to do it at that specific time or something's always more important than getting together. You know, one of my pet peeves is when I hear people say that they want more of Jesus. And, and, and we hear that a lot. It's my pet peeve because if people want more of Jesus, they have the word of God. They have the Bible. Jesus is the word. You know, another thing that Jesus said was that when there's two or three gathered together in his name, that he's in the midst. So when people all, when people tell me that they want more of Jesus, well, then fellowship with some brothers and sisters. Jesus is in the midst. You know, get the Bible. Read the Bible. He's the word of God. There's more of Jesus there. You know, so um, this also reminds me of, um, of the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, Jesus says to this church, I know your works your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who are, who say they are apostles and they are not. You have found them to be liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. You know, that sounds really, really good. And we all wish we could have that in our, in our lives. But Jesus has a problem with them. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And, you know, that could be every other soil except the good soil. Is that, yes, we attend church. Yes, we received it with joy at one point. Um, but the pleasures of life is overtaking us. Um, you know, temptation drives us away. Um, we fall away. You know, do we love the word of God as much as we love everything else? You know, the greatest command is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And one of the evidences of, of a true believer is his love for God, his love for the word of God. You know, Psalms 119, there's a ton of different times David will tell you how many times he loves the word of God. And so this is just a, a, a self-examination, you know, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. And if you're not, that's, you know, that's where grace comes in, you know, ask the Lord for forgiveness, 
He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. We serve a merciful God, a gracious God. So thank you all. I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer.